It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Maria Sarsari to the IMDb seminars. Uh, Maria uh, received her undergraduate title from the University of Crete, and then she moved to the United Kingdom, and she did her PhD in the University of Durham, and um, uh, she finished her PhD in 1997. And then uh, she continued uh, at the universities of Durham and Sussex. And also she has experience as a senior optical scientist for a company called Delarie Holographics. And you also have, you're also a founding member of a company. Yeah, which doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was on board over a few years ago. <laughs> OK. And uh, she's now a researcher at the Institute of uh, Electronic Structure and Data since 2003. And today she's going to talk about 3D laser writing for biomedical applications. So hello everybody and thank you for coming to my talk. It's a great pleasure to speak to my home institute. We do get a couple of ten talks here, but it's nice to pick one for once. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, part of uh, the work of my group, which is uh, three direct laser writing, three D direct laser writing. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, today about uh, the work we do on biomedical applications. I would like to start with apologizing. If I say something wrong in biology, please, my, my biological training is really minimal. But I employ some very good people, and I collaborate with some very good people. So hopefully, you won't find anything that offends you too much. <laughs> so. Um, the main activity of our group is what a, a lot of people call 3D printing. We like to call it direct laser writing. And it's a very powerful tool. Uh, it's a very powerful tool for uh, making structures uh, of uh, millimeter size with nanometer resolution. And you can see a graph of how it works here. We use a laser to directly write inside a photopolymer. Uh, the phenomenon, uh, the principle of, uh, of uh, direct laser writing by photopolymerization is a very old one. Uh, it is based uh, on uh, what's called multiphoton uh, absorption. And this was uh, originally proposed by Maria Gopert Meyer in, uh, in 1931. But because it took, to prove it experimentally, it required uh, intense uh, light fields, it wasn't really uh, shown experimentally until, 19, until after the laser was discovered. It was, it was experimentally demonstrated immediately after the first laser was made. And it is based uh, on what you, on the same phenomenon as you biologists might know as uh, uh, multi-photon microscopy. The idea is that we have, instead of having, uh, you know how we have electronic states in a molecule, instead of having one photon, that goes from the ground state to uh, an elevated state, uh, we use two photons uh, which happen at the same time, and this is a key word here, which, uh, and these two photons can have the same uh, energy as the one photon we use. And they, the, what happens is the one photon goes to an intermediate state, which doesn't exist, it's a virtual state, and because the next photon will arrive at the same time, they can sort of climb. And this is all the physics you're going to hear today, that's it. <laughs> so how how does this uh, how does this translate it into uh, making structures? Imagine you have a material, a liquid. Most of the time, we, we do a lot of work with liquids, which when you expose it to uh, a certain light, UV light. Okay. So what happens is uh, that you take your objective, and you use UV light, and you lightly illuminate inside uh, this material, and what you're gonna have. Is this a solid column here and liquid all around? Now imagine you don't use UV, but you use infrared light. Infrared light, its photons have a lot less energy, have half energy, let's say. This is a key word again. So imagine that you have uh, a, an infrared laser. And imagine you focus it very tightly, and your laser is also ultra fast. This means that you can produce a lot of energy at very short time. Okay, so if you focus it very tightly, then you can create, you can sort of trick the material to believe that instead of having a UV photon, like here, 
it, it can have two photons of the same energy, but of no, or, or, which together have the same energy, but separately they have half the energy. So you can cause the same effect by using a different light. But what, what's the benefit of doing this? There's two main benefits. Firstly, if the material you use is transparent to the wavelength you're using. So you can really go inside the volume of the material. You don't have surface effects. Okay, so you can go inside and, and make this little column that I was saying earlier, but inside your material. The second uh, benefit is that you can go a lot smaller. You don't now have all this column here, but you have only this little dot, because in order to have this polymerization, you have to have very intense fields. And to have these intense fields, you can only have them at the focus of your beam. So now, so instead of having this whole column here, you have a little dot solid inside your liquid. Now, imagine you, have, you can move your beam and you start writing inside the liquid. Then what you have is you have a design inside your liquid which is following your beam shape. So this is how you can make some very, very interesting things, like not, not always useful, this, uh, like this ballerina you see here. And uh, this uh, structure here, which is the, the, uh, was made by one of my former students, Johanna Sakilari, and it's the record of resolution of what, 60 nanometers. So, and you can, you can imagine now that there is, no, there is no other technology that can give you this kind of shapes and this kind of resolution in one step. If you, usually, if you want to make 3D things, you have to make them 2D and then assemble them. This one happens in one step. So you <coughs> Have your design on the computer, you write it inside uh, your material, you wash it, and you're left with your same shape. This is the process as I described it to you. Uh, this is what our, our lab looks uh, like, and you're very welcome to come and visit us. We're physically next door here. Uh, so we have a, a material, a monomer. We focus our light very tightly inside using an objective. We polymerize only at the focal spot where the light is uh, focused, then we move the laser beam and we start writing. After we have finished, we take our sample, we put it into a, a solvent. This solvent is, will dissolve the area where we have not written, but it will uh, leave the area where we have written, and then we're left with a 3D structure made of some kind of polymer. Now, when it comes to bio-applications, th this is a technology that has mostly been applied today in photonics. Uh, and small production things. So, uh, bio-application is still a relatively new and relatively small area uh, of this field. And people have been working in three, uh, three areas, uh, making 3D microfluidics, like this uh, micro valve that you see here. They have uh, been working on making three-dimensional scaffold to investigate how cells grow and how cells uh, uh, react with uh, specific materials. And also they use it to, to functionalize services, like uh, this structure you see here. So uh, in this talk, I will talk, talk to you briefly about all these things and uh, uh, what other people have been doing, and, but mostly what we have been doing. And uh, uh, I will tell you how, how we see the future of this uh, technology. So microfluidics is still a very small uh, activity in the world. As far as I know, there are three groups working on this. Uh, the two other groups uh, that are working on it is um, uh, Roberto Salami's group in Italy and another uh, group in Denmark. And they have been doing beautiful work incorporating three-dimensional structures inside conventional microfluidic things. And this, uh, chips. and this is something we would like to do as well. So what you see here, this is a small filter inside a commercial chip. They have a, they filter it. They filter uh, blood and uh, red and white blood cells, and because they have different uh, size, they can very uh, accurately separate them and uh, put white cells on one side and red on the other. And uh, this is uh, the beauty of this technology is that you can have very high accuracy. If we know that the cell difference is one micron, two micron, then we can make a filter that will really uh, distinguish this small uh, difference. And uh, this is another uh, thing that would, uh, another uh, work, some other work uh, that has been done by the Danish group. And they, here, they have made here scaffolds of different shape. You see different geometries, and they investigate. Uh, in flow, how cells grow. And this is very, very interesting as well. And also, I, I, I tell you, the beauty of this is 
is that they have taken a, a, something that's commercial and they have put their own little thing there. And, and we, we have to, we're working on a project to do this as well. We are only talking about that cell, that cell. I mean, they are mobilized and they are not... No, 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 they are live cells as far as I know, they are under code. And if you speak to Eletheria, recently she's been doing some work on this. So we have, uh, we have been working on uh, microfluidics, but on freestanding structures. And this is not as good, but we, can, uh, we have made some much more complicated things. Uh, one of the things we've been working on, on is this um, kind of microfluidic valves, which are, are designed to, for blood flow. Uh, so uh, when I'm saying blood flow, I'm saying one of the, the people that did the, uh, the, the fluid dynamics on this have taken uh, into account the viscosity of blood and all the properties of blood. It's, it was designed by some colleagues of ours in, uh, here at the University of Piraeus. So this is the design they came up with. And this is what we built. And I would like to point to you the, the similarity between the two structures. This is, what, this is an AutoCAD design. And this is what we made in the lab. And you see they're exactly the same. And the beauty of, uh, another beauty of what we're doing is that we can scale it. So if we have a specific requirement from a specific patient, let's say, or for a specific application, then by just adding a factor on the CAD design, we can make it smaller or bigger or wider or shorter or uh, change the dimensions of it. So this is uh, two different valves. This is a, a lot taller and this is a lot shorter. And uh, this were done by just scaling the design. Uh, and this valve moves, if you look at it here, you can see that we can, if you put it under the microscope, you can move up and down. I should also add here that one part of the casing of the valve is missing for uh, visualization reasons. We have full valves as well, but uh, in order to see it moving, it was much simpler to just take off some of the casing. Take off, physically take off. No, well, we never built it. I never built it. Yeah, we, we changed the design, so we left one quarter of the casing outside. So this is just simulation. No, no, it's a, it's a real uh, study. Uh, it's a real you never study. You built the, the full, you built we the We have built the full. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe I, I don't remember if I have photographs here, but I can show you. We have built the full, but you cannot look inside and see what happens. Okay. So what we also built yeah. another one, which a quarter of the casing is missing, so right. that we can look inside. We all did this test with the full one, but it's not so <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Uh, so this is the second design we have just published. This is the second iteration that uh, Dimitris Karalekas and Pireos came up with. And this, uh, this is a much more sophisticated valve and much more difficult to, to build because it has flaps. And these flaps move up and down. The idea is that if, you move, uh, if you're trying to move up the flap, uh, the flap lifts like this and lets the blood flow. And if you uh, reverse it, the flaps fall down and blocks flow. Uh, we're also collaborating with Samos Pisarakis, he's a researcher at our institute here, and we're, we're doing on uh, making things like sensor, microfluidic sensors, and uh, this specifically is a gas sensor, which uh, Vaso of Galicinaki is doing for the PhD. Uh, and uh, this one is, is immediately functional because it's built on optical fiber. So we can build this thing directly on optical fiber and measure uh, ethanol and fumes and other chemical fumes. By just, uh, and the principle behind it is that if you have, um, we have this gap here, which I'm not sure how visible it is, but uh, we have this gap here and we have uh, multiple reflections of light, and if you put uh, some, uh, some steam in there, uh, the, this, uh, the refractive index of air changes, so the, this, uh, this uh, multiple reflections uh, um, shift, and then you can directly measure that using the optical fiber itself. We have also been doing a lot of work on uh, making, uh, uh, investigating uh, polymerization of uh, biodegradable materials. These are materials, uh, I, I probably failed to mention earlier that all the materials we use, all the materials I spoke about uh, up to now, are materials that we make in our lab. Uh, we don't make uh, biodegradable materials. These are done by collaborators. Uh, this, uh, what I'm showing you here, is a photopolymerized uh, BSA and uh, avidin. We, it's a paper we published a few years ago with a, in collaboration with a, f a group in Finland. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a unique structure because it was the first uh, three-dimensional structure of uh, protein where 
the photoinitiator or the material that causes photopolarization was also a biological material, in this case, flavinol nucleotide. So this is purely biological, there's nothing chemical involved in this. All the previous materials were plastics, polymers? Uh, the, the, specifically, they are hybrids, they are organic and organic materials, they are uh, kind of oxides with organic groups on them, which give them this functionality. And everything is made here. Okay. We also collaborate with uh, Fred uh, Kleinsens in, uh, in, uh, in uh, at uh, Sheffield University. To where he he makes uh, biodegradable polymers. He makes uh, things like the biodegradable uh, PLA. Well, PLA is always biodegradable, but the one that he makes had it can, is also has also some acrylic groups on them, so we can photopolymerize it. And uh, we have used uh, bone cells and nerve cells on them to, to see how the cells grow and how they respond to biodegradation. What is PLA? Polylactic acid. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so this is a special PLA. In fact, it's not a normal one you buy from Aldrich. It's an activated PLA which can be structured very accurately, like you see here. Uh, we also work, uh, do a lot of work with hybrid materials, and we have uh, one material that we use particularly is a, is a zirconium silicon material, which is completely biocompatible. And we work with uh, Maria Jose Nicolaidu and Kelly, uh, and Kelly Belloni on this, and um, also uh, other groups to put, uh, and uh, Helen Papalaki from uh, the medical school to put uh, cell lines on them, but also we use the uh, Stem cells on this, we have submitted the paper, in fact, has been accepted now. And uh, we can make very uh, co complicated structures, like the ones you see here, and put stem cells on them and see how the, the stem cells respond to the material and the geometry. Another uh, area we're interested in is what is called click chemistry. This is the speciality of Kelly Bologna, who's a professor at the university, at the tech department, at the materials department. And now, uh, uh, what? Uh, Kelly does, she makes materials which have hidden functionalities. So when we make the structures, these functionalities don't, are not uh, affected, but then we can expose those and then click biomaterials on it, on this uh, click things. And this is what you see here. This is some of the structures. We haven't put any biomaterials yet. This is, uh, this is uh, a work in progress. And clicking means covalently linking. Yes, yes. So we want to put biomolecules. So this specific material, uh, uh, is a material that has a, a, a hidden uh, triple bond. Mm -hmm. So when we structure it, this triple bond is not affected at all. But then we can expose this triple bond and we can link other things to it. And how do you expose the triple bond? Uh, I think we'll have to ask Kelly. It's <laughs> some chemical procedure. Uh, another area we're working on is um, uh, biosurfaces using shaped beams, and this is work we've done uh, in our institute in collaboration with another laser group, Stelios Torzakis and Miros Matazo group. And uh, the idea, uh, um, um, this, is, this is not work that has been applied to biology yet, I'm putting it here because this is something that we have, uh, we're doing. One of the things we want to do is um, uh, copy the Salvinia plant. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the lotus effect and the rose effect. There's also the salvinia effect, which I learned about it in the last year. It's this kind of plant, which has, is very hydrophobic, but also can trap uh, air underneath. So if you want to, to create uh, things like cell aggregates, you can also feed them with oxygen underwater. And this is what this plant does. And we, we have found a method now to rapidly fabricate this kind of structures uh, using a polymer. And we're investigating the effect of uh, the size and the therapeutic in the material on cell growth and how this traps oxygen. Uh, on this, uh, on, in this area, we click, this, this work is not related to multiphoto polymerization, but it's the work that uh, Dina Terzaki is doing in co collaboration with Matthias Garbanis and uh, Yanis Karapopoulos, who's here. <laughs> and uh, this is to irrigate surfaces and trying to make them porous so that we can, uh, uh, they can, we can affect, affect cell growth. This was what happened. So, what's the point? You irrigate them, right? Make them porous? Porous, so that we can, uh, uh, you, we can affect uh, stem cell growth on them. Because uh, the stem cell uh, isn't only affected by growth factors, if I understand correctly, but it's very uh, uh, 
dependent on topography. And we are trying to influence that topography to, uh, to do uh, this. And this is uh, another area where we're making, uh, uh, Dina is making uh, ketosan uh, scaffolds. <coughs> she's making, she's, and by irradiating on different substrates, even though the substrate is, a, is something that doesn't participate in the process, uh, but by putting different substrates, you can change the, uh, the, proper, the surface properties of this material, and this affects the cell growth eventually. So you can see by putting them on. I mean, uh, for me, it's quite remarkable. Silicon, and if you radiate the same material on the different substrate, then you get so many different, quite completely different effects. Now, of course, this has to do with heat dissipation and reflection and all this. And another area we're doing, another thing we're looking in, and we're, we're this is this is a kind of pet project, but we're, we're progressing. We're trying to make a device out of uh, mastic out of mastic gum, because all we all know quite uh, how useful mastic gum is, and how antibacterial, and how all these beautiful things uh, you can make with mastic. One thing you cannot do is structures, but uh, the, the way we can make it, uh, you can make it flat surfaces, but you cannot uh, make. Uh, uh, structures out of this. So what Dina did is she made uh, she mixed it with gelatin, and you can see by influence by mixing it with gelatin, you can really influence uh, the surface and make pores. But also you can grow cells in them, and then of course it's antibacterial in all this. What we're really interested in to try to make structures, and this is these are masking structures, but they are not made with a laser. What we have to do here because masking is not a material that you can process with a laser, is that we make uh, molds, we make a structure using a, another material, we make a copy of it in DNS, and then we kind of mask it and make this kind of structures out of masking. What we have in mind for this system is to try to make drug delivery systems. Things like uh, uh, micro needles uh, or things that would penetrate the skin and which would kind of deliver um, uh, a drug, but it will also be antibacterial as well. So, and now this is all the general things uh, I wanted to tell you, and I'm going to speak to you about these two specific projects that we have been doing uh, in a lab. The first one is with Anna Mikaki, and it's on, uh, it's basically the PhD of Dina Terzaki, and the second one is with Maria Hazin Kovaido, and uh, a professor from Brazil called Vladimir Gironik. So, I'm going to talk to you about two things. The first one is mineralization of uh, biomedic 3D scaffolds as a new route to bomb dish engineering, and the second is self assembling 3D scaffolds. And what we had, a, uh, what Anna was thinking to do was to try to mimic nature. And uh, things like nature and uh, seashells are very hard, are very, very, uh, are very, very strong. And this uh, mechanical strength doesn't, doesn't only come from the composition, which is basically hydroxyapatite, but it, it, its main uh, origin is geometry. The fact that you have this crystallite uh, geometry, which is uh, embedded on some proteins. This proteins, is a, a, by happy coincidence, is the ones that Anna has been working on, the amyloid self-assembling uh, peptides. So these are the, uh, the uh, peptides that uh, I'm talking about, they have uh, very good mechanical properties, they are stable, they are very chemically, uh, and uh, they are very stable to chemical, uh, to chemistry, chemical uh, and uh, mechanical uh, stress. Uh, uh, silk is one of them which is widely known, uh, also uh, spider silk is one well uh, known of them. We have been collaborating with Anna on this for many, many years. And about, I think this was, yeah, 2008, we published a paper which showed that this uh, amyloid peptides, we could get them to sit on the structures we made with a laser. And not only sit, but also self-assemble between them and make a kind of self-assembling nanostructure. So what you see here uh, is uh, structures made with a laser. This is the two uh, kind of uh, fingers you see here. But the water in between is a self-assembled peptide. And we can do that selectively by changing the, chem the surface chemistry of the, of the structures. 
this was published in 2008, and we've continued to work on this. Uh, our, my group uh, developed a new material for this purpose, developed a new material which could uh, be functionalized with gold ions and gold nanoparticles. And uh, this is the material, uh, what it consists of. It's again, it's an organic and organic hybrid. It has a lot of silicon and it's got a lot of zirconium in it. But it also has this little group here, which uh, is a monomer, we can uh, widely use by people who make uh, polymer brushes, but we can put it inside our structures and it will polymerize in our cellular structures, so it will stay permanently. And this amine group at the surface, we can link them to gold. And we can make, uh, uh, we can, uh, so we can decorate our structures with gold nanoparticles, but also with a gold monolayer, which is what we did in fact with Anna. Anna on her side developed some new peptides, which were, uh, I'm correct me if I'm wrong. So, which were octapeptides, self-assembling. They had a, a cysteine group in it, in the cysteine group, which may, may, made it connect to the um, to the structures. But it also had an aspartic, uh, two aspartic groups in it, which made it connect to hydroxyapatite. So, because all this, we're doing it trying to mimic nature, nice uh, to mi mimic nature. So, this is the bifunctional peptides that uh, Anna and Dina developed. These are, um, they self-assemble, you can see here, they create fibers, but also they can be decorated with gold nanoparticles, which is what we want so that we can link them to our structures directly. They also connect with hydroxyapatite. So this ones, we can make them, and then the uh, calcium phosphates will sit on them and make structures. So this is the process, the structures that we follow. Uh, which is a complicated structure. The, the first step is to make our structures using our uh, laser. Then we put a, 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 some, uh, a gold layer on this, and this is important that we only put a monolayer on this, and we don't have gold nanoparticles. Uh, we just put a, a single layer of gold on it, and then uh, we deposit our peptides on the surface, which self assemble and build bridges, like in the, for, uh, in the previous process. Then we put calcium phosphate uh, solution in it, and we can decorate them with calcium phosphates. Can you explain again what the role of the gold is? The gold is the link here between the peptide and the uh, and the structure. So the peptide would not adhere if it didn't have any gold. No, it would wash away. Yeah. Uh, so these are the results. What you see here is structures made with a laser. We can see the, the crystals of, uh, of calcium phosphates on it. And you can see all the, also these nano bridges that I showed you earlier that are completely uh, covered with uh, hydroxyapatite. Now, when Maria has in Kola, you did some cell culture on this, 3D structures, and you can see how much more the cells prefer to sit on this uh, on the peptides than on the substrate. You, you can, this uh, peptide deposition is selective. If we put it a structure and we put it on a glass, the peptides will only sit on uh, the structure. It will not sit on the glass. So this is what you get after two days, and after eight days you get completely covered. What the cell of cells are in this uh, It's uh, MC3T3, isn't it? It's uh, osteogenic cells. And when uh, you measure the, uh, the calcium that they produce, it is uh, it's similar to using a bone factor, mm -hmm. a growth factor. So this is the other part of the project I'm going to talk to you about, and this, this is the work. That we, uh, this is this is the brainchild of a good friend, a collaborator, Professor Vladimir Miranov. He has spent several months here, the last couple of years, to work on this project, and he again uh, is working on a bone. Uh, scaffolding, and he wants to make, again, to mimic nature, but this time we're mimicking the bear. This is a little plant here, which uh, when it hooks on your globe, it's almost impossible to get rid of. So his idea was, uh, why don't we, not we make this kind of structures, which would be injectable scaffolds? So if you want to, to treat a bone defect, instead of putting uh, printing cells or putting a cell implant there, you make lots of aggregates of cells, mechanically supported by this kind of structures. And then you can inject it and make it, and when they inject them, they come close together after the solvent goes, they hook, uh, and you can uh, have much uh, faster treatment of uh, a bone defect. 
Now, I'm, I'm not sure how this will ever work, but it was fun, really a real fun working, working on this project because making such, that's such a complicated and elaborate structure is it's very interesting for us. And uh, anyway, it was a fun project to work on. That's what I was say. So, Vladimir uh, came up with this, these designs, which are uh, basically concentric uh, balls. They have about uh, 250 microns diameter, but they can, uh, we have calculated that they can fit a few thousand cells in them. And uh, so the cells would be inside? Yes. Okay, and then, uh, so instead of waiting for cell bone to grow alone, you kind of help it. I, we, we used uh, the same material that we used for an anas, uh, to immobilize anas peptides with the idea that we would like maybe make it a bit stronger in the future and uh, put some peptides on them. So this is what we made. You can see them. These are very, very difficult structures to make. And they make I really thank, uh, really I need to thank my students for making this because this is uh, very, very elaborate structures, as you can see. And uh, you can see different aspects of it. You can see this is a structure with the hooks. This is without the hooks. This is a half structure. We did this because we want to look inside and see how hard it looks if it has a concentric uh, uh, geometry. And we also made one with arrows because the idea also wasn't just to hook, but trying to kind of like a, like a harpoon it in a way. So we made that as well. And this was, this was pretty difficult to make as well, but we did. Anyway, and we made it round. And I might, you might not appreciate the beauty of this thing, but uh, making around structures when you when you have a laser beam that is not around because laser beams are all oval shaped. This is very difficult, but we managed to make it and put under and see it move and it's you can see the circular. It's like a ball. So they also hook. We took some photographs of that under the microscope. Once you put them together, it's impossible to separate them. I mean, if working at this scale, also it's very difficult as well. But anyway. So the next question is, how do you put cells there? I mean, cells don't like to climb. This is my understanding of it. So we have to somehow to force this to do it. And the, the idea that the Vladimir had was to make holes in agarose and then put the cells, the, these balls there, and put the cells and try to kind of force them to make a, a spheroid. And it worked. It took us a few efforts, but eventually we managed to fill these uh, balls with cells. And this is, uh, they also created other aggregates. You see, this is a control sample. Now, we wanted to see how this uh, fuse and how they develop. This is what you see, this ball inside this other hole. But then you see next door another, <coughs> another uh, uh, spheroid without any support. But when you put them together, they kind of fuse. And this is exactly what we wanted to do, to see that they, it doesn't affect its fusing uh, properties. And also, we took, took some fluorescent measurements. Now, this is a big lie here because, uh, I mean, my understanding is that uh, red is dead, green is uh, alive, but also our structures are very green. So how can you tell the, the, the dead there? The truth is that we have a terrible problems with autofluorescence. It's something we're trying to deal with it with other methods. And the, the next step of us of this would be to see how this um, how these uh, cells develop. But the fact that they, they kind of fuse is a, is a testament that they stay alive. It's not, uh, we don't really need this confocal measurements. So this, this is still a working project, uh, a progress where we want to continue to work on this because it's, a, it's an interesting project for us and it kind of makes us learn a lot of things. Of course, if we wanted to really make it um, functional, we have to go to biodegradable materials. The materials we use now are are not biodegradable, are hard materials. And, and this is a very tricky thing because getting biodegradable materials with the equivalent mechanical properties is, is a bit suspect, but it's anything. It's, uh, may anyway. I, may I interrupt you? Can you recover the cells from this uh, mold? Well, take them out. Take them out. Uh, I, I have no <laughs> idea. I wouldn't think so. Uh, <laughs> because there are cases, biology, for example, with the embryonic stem cells or cancer cells, that you put cells uh, and uh, force them to aggregate mm -hmm. and make balls. Yeah, like it's a spheroid. Embryoid bodies or a tumor uh, sphere. But then you need to 
No, but I mean, but we can make this structure could uh, impose a regular shape, but you can get a similar size. size. For but example, this has got nothing to do with lasers. Right. If you do this, if you put cells yeah. in this geometry, you get this. Mm -hmm. There you go. This this doesn't have a, a structure mm -hmm. underneath. You just need to get the cells to 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 grow in a specific geometry. And this is it's mm -hmm. got nothing to do with our technology. We you can see it here as well. This is a mm -hmm. This is a hole in the agarose, and we put cells in it, and they were forced to make a spheroid. Also, yes, we also do that by hanging drops. You know, we put cells and we hang the drops, so they form. But the, they are not uh, they are heterogeneous, for example. They are smaller or bigger, or uh, and this is a problem, you know, for example. I, one of the things we're looking I remember I was discussing with Anfi about this problem. With, uh, yeah, I don't think we can create all homogeneous. Uh, Size. Size. EBs. Very important. Okay, so, uh, so uh, this is one of the things we want. Uh, I'm not sure about homogeneous, because really it's not something I've looked into. Uh, but this uh, functional services I'm talking about, this Salvinia, mm -hmm. this is what we want to use it for, to make um, cell entities. Okay? Now, uh, I'm hoping that by, J, by affecting the geometry, we will be able to affect the size. So this is something that we're looking at. Uh, what we, we would really like to do is to make this out of a protein. And we have a project to, with Anna and uh, some people abroad to do this. So instead of having a, a hard ball like we have here, we have something like an elastic ball. And this, you wouldn't need to recover the cells. You would have them there, and then we would do it. You know. But this, this is something that would happen. You know, we're working on it, we're working on it. So uh, what I'm saying, I would like, uh, we would very much, much like to put nanoparticles in this structure so that we would be, give them other uses. We would like to put peptides. We would really, really like to make them for biological and biodegradable materials. And of course, we'll do in vivo experiments and prove Vladimir's principles. So this is all I had to tell you. I'm sorry, it's a bit short talk, but uh, this is all the biology we do. So. Uh, as I said, um, this this work is we are laser lab, and the fact that we have a biological um, project running is testament to our good biologists, friends, and collaborators who uh, are doing all the bio work. And these are all these people here. Especially, I would like to make Anna, which is we mentioned Anna and Maria and Makaki and Anfi, which is have been Anfi and Ella, who have been collaborators for many many years. We published lots of things together. And this is the people that have really done the work. So thank you very much.